happy Lambda Conf Tuesday, everyone. And today we have Harold Carr with us. Thank you so much for being willing to come and hang out with us this Tuesday and to give this talk. We're really excited. Um, and I will let you take it away. Okay, well, just to make sure I, I'm in the right room. Can you read that? Yes, I can read that. That is the correct one. Yep, I'm a speaker, official. <laughs> so uh, my examples are going to be in Haskell. I was just informed that I didn't mention Haskell anywhere in the description or the title. So sorry for misleading you. So I'm going to show basically how to use phantom types and existentials to get real work done. I'm not going to say how internally they work, the theory behind them, nothing like that. Just here's the nuts and bolts of how to actually use these things to get something done. And the example I'm going to use is uh, over here, like it lines 30 through 39 as a little uh, example. And I'm going to have a bunch of gauges that are reading fuel levels. Fuel levels are for a rocket. And then we're going to check those readings. And that's the first place that we, that's the place that we use the phantom types. Because after you've done that checking, we want to attach the fact that we did that check to the actual type. So that way downstream, bad things don't, can't happen, shouldn't happen because you're carrying the fact that you've done that check in the type so the compiler will be able to help you. Then to talk to the pure code and the pure code is kind of like this artificial intelligence mission control. So we keep doing these readings and finding information about the rocket and we tell mission control and it makes some decisions and returns an output. And to talk to them, we're using object-oriented program in Haskell, you can actually do it. And uh, I'll have more to say about that, but I do that by way of an existential. And then when it's done with its out, when it's made its decision and sends an output, it comes the output with some state, but we don't want that state to be available over here. The only thing we want over here in the IO is for the next time it calls into the pure code to send that state back in. So we can use that state for the next round, but we don't want this out here to be able to muck around with that state. So we hide that state, even the fact, the type of what it is in an ex existential. And the last piece is the outputs. The outputs tell, tell you what you can do next. And I'm using a thing called type like type aligned sequences and that also use an existential. And we'll see all of that in gory detail. So let's get started. So first of all, we're gonna just look at the part where you have a gauge. And to work with gauges, I'll show you what goes on here. Over on the right, I'm going to have a, uh, REPL, so uh, we can run a few things. So I'm loading that up. And I'm going to now import standard system random and build a random number generator. And because the gauge that I'm using is this thing right here, line 58. And this is just set up. And it's something where every time you read it, it's gonna, this gauge starts at zero right here, line 58. It has a maximum increase. In other words, every time you read the gauge, it can increase somewhere between zero and one from its last reading and the maximum value it will ever get to is 10. Once it gets to 10, it's just gonna stop because it's full uh, yeah, conceptually. So let's try one of these gauges and then say to read the gauge. And if we see reading the gauge over and over again, it gives some different numbers that are increasing. And the main thing is, is we're going to use a standard generation with a, a generator with a C137. And the reason I'm doing that is so during these examples, we get the exact same readings every time. 
because uh, it makes it easier for demoing and also easy. See, we're going to get that same sequence every time. Okay, so this is just set up. Now, here's the next piece. As a software, we're building this, this basically, we're building uh, uh, Cape Canaveral and uh, Houston Mission Control. And, but we're given, you know, what the other contractors give us. So we've got their gauges and we've got a couple of things from them, this thing called check max flow. So given a list of doubles, the readings, it's going to tell you whether it ever exceeded the max flow. In other words, we're setting the max flow to 1.0. So between one reading and the next, if it ever, the difference is ever greater than one, something's wrong. And so we can see though, there is, and then it works. Here's one where I, it, it's given a bunch of readings and it gives them back if it's right. And if there's one that's a little bit too big and there's one that's 1.1, then it says it exceeds max flow. The trouble with this thing, and we can make sure that that actually works by <coughs> running it and we see that the test does run correctly. Okay, here's the problem with that thing is that, check this out, we're giving it a zero and then a minus five and then a one. Well, the difference between these are 1.5 and it gives back the exact same thing. In other words, it passed max flow. The reason that is, is because max flow expects this list to be in decreasing order. Fortunately, the people that build these gauges gave us something that does that, check decreasing. So if we look, it says, here's one that's decreasing, here's one that's decreasing, line 106, it's not decreasing. So it actually works. And the way you use these things is you actually use them in order. So first you check decreasing. If it fails, then you get a gauge exception. If it doesn't fail, then you check the maximum flow. In other words, that it can't go over 1.0. And if that succeeds, then you get a double or you get an exception. And so now if we look at what goes on here, we see that all five of those pass and in particular, this one here, which above, remember this passed because it needed to be checking decreasing first. So now because decreasing is checked, we see left of not decreasing. Uh, there's a little to do here about, there's a below zero here. We're just gonna leave that in our code as a bomb uh, for later. Okay, so now we're going to hook up. So we've got the gauges. We just looked at the checking routines. Now we're gonna hook up the gauges to checks. So the checking routine is just something that takes that list of doubles and returns either the exception or that same list because it passed the check. So here's a loop. And this is just something I'm gonna keep using this, <clears throat> pretty much this exact same loop every time just to show how everything works. And here it's given the list of doubles. It's given the checking routine, the list of doubles seen so far in this loop, the checking routine, the gauge that can return a double and it'll finally return a single double. So how it works is first we read the gauge, just kind of print it out so we can see what's going on. Then we add that reading to the front of the existing readings, we do the check, and if there's an error, we're just gonna bomb out right then and there, no, no further questions asked. Otherwise, we have one that passed, and we're just gonna keep going around this loop until we finally get to our maximum reading. That's it. So, let's take a look. Here's one where the gauge is, is set to start at zero, only to increase by one and max to 10, which is what the ab above code is expecting. So if we look at that over on the right, you can see the readings that come out and they're 
decreasing from the point of view if you're looking at it from the bottom, uh, and they find and they're not increasing by more than 1.0 anywhere. But now let's try one where we build a gauge specifically that can increase up to 2.0 per round. So just so we can give it a gauge that doesn't match the specification of the checkers. So if you look over here, we run that and sure enough, we get an exceeds max flow exception. So now we're like, great, all our problems are solved because we're gonna catch all the errors possible right off the bat when we read things in the IO module before we ever give them to the pure module. So everything's gonna go great. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, here's an undetected, if, if we only, if we, if, if we write this code and we like only use check max flow, then we're gonna have a problem if we get a faulty gauge. Because here's one that every time we read the gauge, it this is just stuck in there. It has nothing to do with real code, but it's just a way to exercise the system. It says the minute that R is greater than 3.0, then turn it into a minus R. And let's see what happens. Uh, in other words, between the, when we read that gauge, the gauge went bad uh, at a certain point. And if we look at it running, well, oh shoot, we get a infinite loop, not good. Uh, and that is because we forgot to use both checks. We're only using check max flow. And there was nothing in the type system that helped us know that we did that we missed both checks because all we're looking at is listed doubles and uh, the checks, that's it. So it doesn't know. Here's one where we actually do both checks. First, we check the decreasing one. The, oh, this is, remember, this loop gets the checking room team passed in right there, line 164. And that first time I was just passing in check max flow as the checking routine. This time the routine is going to say first do check of decreasing and then check max flow. So if you do the right thing and use the gauges correctly, boom. Now, even though the gauge broke, we check it. So that's a good thing. So now we know always use both of these things. Types are not going to help us, but we know to do that. And we'll always do that because we're good programmers. So now let's uh, pass the check. We, we, what we've done so far, we looked at the gauges. We looked at doing checks. Once we've done those checks, we give that check input to the pure code and tell the pure code, we've already done everything for you. Don't worry about it. Just use it because we've checked it. So the downstream code is going to be a function that takes a double and returns a Boolean. That Boolean says when it's done uh, and you don't need to do any more. And what that downstream function is in this example is it's something that takes the head of that list and it knows there's something in there because we promised it uh, from the other side, the IO side that we were going to put data in there and, and never give it an empty list. And we're gonna check that it's ever greater than 10. So this is the exact same code. The only difference is <clears throat> after the check, and remember this is just a tight little loop, but in real code, you know, you've got this module over here doing checking and then doing a bunch of stuff and passing data to another module and to another module. And finally, sooner or later, it gets down to where it needs to be used. And you're only in charge of one of those modules and somebody else in uh, the other side of the world, 12, 12 time zones away at night said, you know, I need to turn that into an empty list point for whatever reason. And so they do that uh, after it was checked. So when you run this thing, we find out that boom, Oh, prelude, empty list. We got an exception. The, the pure code threw an exception. Pure code throwing exceptions, that really sounds weird, uh, but it happens. Uh, so bad news, that's really bad news. 
So we got to do something about that. So here's the first thing, and this actually has nothing to do with phantom types, but it's part of the whole story I'm trying to build here. And that is make data correct by construction. And another way to say that is to make invalid states unrepresentable. And I'm going to do that in this case by using data list dot not empty. So now the checking routine, instead of taking a list of doubles, is going to take a non empty of doubles and then do the check and return that same non empty if things go well. And these are the checking routines just updated. You don't need to look at those in detail. They just now work with non empties. And the downstream list, same thing. It's just now a non empty downstream list. And the only difference is now it uses non empty head rather than prelude head. The nice thing about non empty, non empty can't be empty. <laughs> so a good name for it, it can't be empty. So you know, when you, to construct a not empty, you have to give it at least one element. So in this case, what I'm doing is same, same list, uh, but now I'm calling uh, non empty cons instead of using the colon cons operator of the, for the pushing this onto the front of the list. And I'm doing the downstream call here, which is telling me if I can stop or not. And here's where I actually start this thing out. I create one with a 0.0, .0 because I know that's a good initial value for the gauges that things should start empty. And I create a non-empty. I do both checks. The chip first check is decreasing, then check max flow. And I give it this downstream, which expects the head of the list to contain the maximum element, which was up here. So now if I run this thing, it worked. Great. Matter of fact, now let's try to do, uh, well, not us, the, the guy that's in that other place 12 time zones away is going to try to do what we said should not happen. So here it is. And if we look, I don't think you can see this, uh, but you'll be able to see it once I put there. The compiler is complaining. It said that it can't match a, 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 a list of A whatevers to the non-empty double. So it was caught at compile time. This, this, the person tried to do that to uh, reverse it. Uh, excuse me, empty it. So uh, you, there, there's, if you're paying attention, you're like, well, why don't they just use something else? Well, we'll get there. <laughs> so here's one where it's pretty much, if you looked at line 247 and compare it to line 272, uh, it's now saying when it's greater, less than three, uh, just give me the same non-empty list. Other, reverse it. And that's fairly easy to do because non-empty is just a regular package and hackage and it's easy to import into any code from anywhere and do things with. So even though we've used non-empties, there can still be problems. So now after we've done the check, somebody in another module is saying to reverse it. So if we look at this, and this one gets to be even weirder because it says not decreasing. So we do catch the error, but we don't catch it right away. What happens is this flips around. We give that to the pure code. The pure code sees the new head of the list as whatever was in the reverse position, which in this case is going to be that, uh, well, actually it's gonna be the 0.0, .0 .0 that we initialized it with. And it says, well, it's not greater than 10, so let's keep going. So then we go around the loop again and we add some, something to the loop, uh, beginning of the loop, and then we call check. And this time is when we find it. And that is a difficult bug because it's a whole timing thing, right? It doesn't happen right where the problem was. It happens after it's flowed through the system and come around again. So that's a pain. So let's uh, to do that. Okay, let's uh, fix some of these problems. Here's a solution using new types. 
And so everything that says capital NT just means new type. So now I have a new type which says, I have a decreasing values new type in a flow OK, meaning max flow OK. And the checking routines, this one takes a non-empty double and then returns uh, either the uh, exception or the decreasing values. And this one, now you have to use them in order. By the way, you know, before you could mix those up too, because they were both just took doubles and returned the same thing. Now this says, no, it has to happen in a certain order. It has to be decreasing is the only thing I take. And then I'm going to return flow okay if things go well. And I have a type called new type cons because I have to be able to take things apart. So what I've done here is when I con something on, that also is the checking routine. Now it's before we were doing consing separately and then checking. Now they're combined. Oh, and one thing I didn't mention, uh, and I guess I don't really need to mention here, when you're doing this kind of stuff here, you'd be doing this and you've really got to carefully control what you're ex exporting. In this case, you would export the type decreasing values NT and flow NT, but you would not export the constructors. So you can basically consider everything that I'm uh, highlighting here would be in a different module and you would selectively export things. And that's all these solutions I'm gonna show all require the same thing. We have a separate module and you're very careful because if you let somebody get inside these things and take them apart and put them back together, well then you're basically back in the same territory of having a list of doubles. So you've got to uh, control your exports. Uh, okay, so here, here we go. So now we're saying for the NT version, we do this uh, cons, which I passed in here, the NT cons, and that does the check. If it passes the check, give it to downstream and go. So let's take a look. Great, it worked. Okay, well that's fine. The only trouble with that is, is if somebody does things like accidentally in the future, because they don't know, and this happens all the time, right? You got this code that's been maintained for five years and you got new people coming on and they say, oh, I need this constructor. Oh, I need to make it public so I can, uh, so I need to export it. And then later somebody says, oh, well that's available. So I'm gonna use it and you're back to where you Or you have things like deriving num and then you start using or list of doubles in this case, but something like that. Uh, and you can't derive the list of doubles, but basically, so these things disappear. Well, one thing I didn't say too, because this talk is both at a slightly above beginner level and an intermediate level at the same time. Because uh, a lot of this stuff is, is pretty straightforward, but new types, if, if you're not aware, are just a way, if you have a data, a piece of data, with, and this is the type of the data, and then the constructor. There's only a single constructor and a, it has uh, a single field. You can use a new type. And the nice thing about new types is they disappear at runtime. So at runtime, the only thing that's gonna be seen is the non-empty double. All the rest of this is just used by the compiler. Okay, so we did this one. Now we're gonna do, finally, we made it to phantom types. Uh, what time is it? 2.28, and we finally made <laughs> it. Uh, okay, so the idea is we're doing, going to do the same thing we just did, only we're going to do with phantom types. So now I have this thing, new type called a gauge reading. And the gauge reading takes this type of type var uh, variable, P. But notice that P is not referenced anywhere on the right side. That's what mechanically makes it a phantom type. And in other words, it's never gonna show up at runtime. It just won't be there. Uh, and wh so why do we do it? Well, we've just declared these two data types, decreasing values and flow okay. And notice they have no constructors. So there's not even any way to build an instance of either of those. And that's fine because we just need them to be types. 
So what we're going to have now are, are check decreasing and check max flow look very similar. It starts with the non-empty double. It returns a gauge reading and notice now where that T was on line 331, there's a very specific type, decreasing values. So that's what's gonna come back. And then checking max flow, it expects a decreasing values reading and then it will return a flow okay reading. So other than that, this pretty much looks the same. We have the same sort of cons operator, which also does a check, and it pretty much looks identical. It takes the doubles out of the gauge readings, and notice when I say gauge readings, it only grabs the value here, and that was this double that was right here. This, there's no P, it, it just doesn't exist. It only existed at compile time. So I check decreasing, uh, I, I cons it on the front of the list. I check decreasing and if it passes, I check max flow. Okay, so now the downstream function is going to take the gauge readings of flow okay and a Boolean. The rest of this looks pretty much identical all the way through downstream call. The gauge readings on and on. Okay, let's, let's go. Let's see if it works. Hey. It worked. All right. So the question is, if I did this with new types and I did it with phantom types, so why do one over the other? Well, one interesting reason is right here, starting at line 371, is you can actually, what, what you can't do with new types is you can actually make more complicated types in the phantom position. And I'm doing this using a library called refined. The uh, refined is basically the phantom type. So it has a refined constructor and this is the type position and this is the value position. So notice what's in the type position. It says and it's it's so what it's a, if you have a decreasing values flow okay it is a conjunction of decreasing values and flow okay and this thing can be as arbitrarily complex as you want to be ands and ors and all sorts of things you can play all your type level magic at this point the the main point is is because you're using phantom types you can actually have more complex information in the type, whereas the new type allowed you to basically state one thing. So to create one of these it, using the refined library, and don't worry about this details very much, but it just, it, you have this predicate for this type and you first check the decreasing, which we've always done, and then check the max flow. If it passes both, great, it just returns pure because under the covers, it's going to do something else. You actually don't call validate yourself. Uh, otherwise, it's going to throw an exception. So here's where we con something on. This is where you're actually adding data. So if you're given a double, you're given one of these refined types, which has already been checked to have the decreasing value and the max flow checked. We're going to either get the refine exception or we're going to get an updated version of that. And the way that's done is it takes that double you gave it, it calls unrefine on what you've given it so far, which is a way to get the values out of the refinement type. Oh, and I should, I, did, I didn't mention, I mean, the reason it's called refinement type, you probably heard of things like refinement types in liquid Haskell. And it's, it's a way to restrict the types even more. So they refines them. So you can have an int. You have a like, no, I want to have an int from one to 10. Then you would refine that particular int type to say, no, this is an int from one to 10. In this case, I'm refining a non-empty list of doubles to be a decreasing list with the max flow okay. So once I've cons that on the front of the non-empty li list, then I refine the output, which creates the refined type. And remember, 
you would export this PS cons to somebody and you would export this. Uh, and actually this predicate would be uh, what you wouldn't, uh, what wouldn't you do? Uh, you actually you'd do pretty much be exporting most of this stuff, but yeah, all of it. Uh, the way, oh, I know what you wouldn't export. And this is again, back to a problem. This is, I don't know a way around this, is, is if somebody uh, took in and said, okay, I'm gonna import the refined library, then they would suddenly have refined and unrefined available. And if they knew the exact type to give something, then they could take things apart on their own. So there's always a hole, there's always an escape hatch. Uh, so even though types will save you, uh, bad imports will kill you. So here's running the same thing now. I have the refinement type. It looks exactly the same. I've got the PS cons, exact, and I start this thing up very similarly, similarly where I create a non-empty list from a list of 0, 0.0, I refine it. I'm doing a from right because refine can throw an exception and, let, and return a left. And for initialization in a test, well, from right's okay. Should be any from right in your code. So I hope your lyncher is going to catch that. Uh, so once again, it wrote, wrote, ran. So that's, that's great. Okay, that's nearing the end of the phantom type part. Uh, there is another case, which I'm actually not going to implement, but we've only right now been working with one gauge. And when one gauge fails, game's over. So what you're really gonna do when we build Cape Canaveral is we're gonna have quadruple redundancy. So for every single, you know, we're gonna have four gauges. And after we've read those four gauges, we're gonna take the readings and we're gonna send all of those readings to this to the pure code. And the pure code's gonna say, well, I'm gonna merge all of those because I know they've been sorted right. And I'm gonna then take the max, which is the head of the resulting merge. The trouble is if somehow we were using fan types and refined types uh, and we gave it some one that was sorted ascending and one that was sort of descending, well, your merge sort, if they were using uh, uh, the one where you just, you, that expects already sorted list, well, they're both sorted, they're just sorted in different directions, then it's not gonna work. And I advise you to look at this uh, on line 433, this uh, paper, Ghost of Departed Proofs. And that has this exact example in it where you're merging streams and you wanna make sure not only are they sorted, but they are sorted exactly the same way. In other words, descending or sending. Uh, so uh, that takes care of that. So that once again, and to do that, the, the ghost of departed proofs uses phantom types. And one last phantom thing here is if you start needing a lot of things, a lot of different instances for your phantom types, take a look at uh, Ed Komet's tag library because it has this thing called tagged line 445, has S, which is the phantom type, and type B, which is the actual value type. But it has all of these instances available. So if you start finding yourself needing lots of this stuff and you're gonna use a lot of phantom types, this is a good thing to know about. And finally, some useful papers on phantoms. And this first one, parse don't validate by Alexis King, that actually is not about phantom types, but it's exactly what we were doing here. It's talking about, you don't wanna just validate and then pass things down because if, if it's still just a list of doubles, bad things can happen. You wanna take that less structured information, which is a list of doubles and turn it into more structured information, which is a non-empty list of descending max flow check doubles. And that's what she means by parsing is, is you actually do the validation, but the data structure that results is carrying that, carrying that validation along. 
And then there's a couple of other things which I'm going to move on because uh, I'm going to still got a lot to do. Okay, existentials. Now we're moving on to existentials. So the very first part of the existential thing is where I said, we, we, what we've done now, we've read one gauge and actually we, we didn't do it, but we read four gauges and sent their inputs here with, on, with phantom types that said how they were, mer how they were uh, sorted. And this guy is going to merge them all together and completely feel comfortable doing that because the compiler tells you it's, they were sorted the same way. And then it makes a decision and sends that decision out in whatever state, internal state, it needs to update for its own in internal state. But it doesn't want that external state available out here. It needs to pass the state out here so it can be passed in the next time into the pure code. But it doesn't want anybody to be able to get inside or even know what's inside. Not only just can't get inside, it doesn't know what's inside. So to do that, you can do that with existential types. So what I've got here, here's the existential line 536. So I've got this thing called pure state and the IO code, that's what they'll see, pure state, nothing else. They, we won't export the constructor, uh, so they won't see that. And notice there's no, type variables here for them to see it. There's only one on the right. Oh, and, and that's kind of like, you know how mechanically, remember on phantom types, uh, we had, let's actually show that. Remember on the phantom type line 331, we had the type variable here on the left, but it's not seen on the right. Well, uh, below, at line 536, notice we have no type variable on the left, but we have one on the right, just the opposite. And mechanically, <laughs> that's what makes it a, a existential type. I mean, there are a lot more going on there, but that's a really easy way to remember phantom or existential is, uh, which side is the, uh, is the type variable on? Okay, so this says for all A, and what, I mean, like, why is it called existential and using for all? Well, we're not going to talk about that. Go uh, look it up. There is a logical reason for that. I mean, what I mean by logical, I mean, in logic, there is a reason. Uh, but uh, let's not go there. We're only talking nuts and bolts here. Somebody else figured that out, and now we're using this stuff. So, okay, we got pure state. And what it does is it has a PSD constructor pure state double, and it takes a p-type of A. So it can be any A for all A. And I'm going to give it a p-type of A that is actually with a construct, constructor p-type of a double. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to be able to recover that double in the pure state, but I don't want it available to the I.O. area. So the only thing that's going to be exported out there is this pure state, but none of, none, not, none of this here. And then I have uh, the pure, oh, and oh, one thing I didn't say, this is the uh, way to define an existential type and line 538 is the same thing using a gadget. Okay, so line 540, this says, uh, What does it say? It says that's the type. Oh yes, that is the type of the downstream of pure state. So it takes a refined of doubles, non-empty doubles, this of the decreasing max flow values. It takes a pure state. Notice there's no type. They don't know anything about it, and it returns a boolean, a double, and a possibly updated. By updated, I mean immutably updated pure state. So here is an example of that function. All it does is it unrefines the, the uh, doubles. It uses the non-empty head to get the greatest value. It asks if it's greater than 10, which is what we've always been doing all along because that's the termination condition. And it's also saying, I want to know the difference between 
the current max value and the previous max value, which was right here. And I'm going to return an updated state with that new max value. So, and this is given to the IO code. So here we see this where here's the list, refined list. There's the pure state. There is the downstream call and it does the exact same thing. It does PS cons to pure state to cons out on the front. It calls the downstream right here, line 563, gets the values back. It prints out the X. You know, you're gonna do something important with that X. For us, we're just printing it. We're gonna determine if the downstream told us to stop. And if so, it's gonna return the R and the X, otherwise just keep looping. So let's give it a try. Uh, that's because that's not what I meant. I meant this one. Ah, it worked. And the important thing here coming, because I'm going to show something else in a moment, is that there's the 10, the last value. There's the difference between the uh, last value and the previous value. So 10 and 9.66. So it worked. Great. Okay, so now the point of this part was we don't want the this part, this module, which is IO, to have access to the state. We need to give it that state just so it can pass, pass it back to us, but we don't want them to be able to get inside. And so the existential allowed us to do that. Okay, the uh, useful papers on existentials. Uh, one found really useful was Jonathan Scott's one on anti existential patterns and anti patterns. And he shows some use cases like to hide an intermediate value, uh, which is not what we did here, uh, to hidden types, which can be unhidden, which is what we did here. And then type aligned data structures, which is going to be an example coming up. And this uh, other one by Mark Karpa of uh, existential quantification. He shows kind of like a spectrum of how much information you can recover from an existential type to nothing uh, to a little bit by using uh, type classes, which a lot of people say is an anti-pattern, uh, and to using gadgets to explicitly restore the quantified variables, which is similar to what we did above before, uh, where I, I used the uh, pattern matching. And then finally, there's this good talk uh, article by uh, Arnaud Bailey and it is a thing where you want you have a quiz made up of different types of questions but the quiz machinery just wants to run through these questions and ask them and you want everybody to be able to uh, give different quiz questions and the uh, and you want to make it open so you can have new types of questions anytime you want without updating the quiz machinery and he has a very good example of that. It uses the existential type class anti-pattern. Uh, so uh, some people say it's an anti-pattern and he found a pretty nice use case. Okay, let's move on. I think we're gonna come in just right. Uh, next case is object-oriented programming using existentials. Uh, and this is one uh, which I would not have shown two months ago. Because I always thought object-oriented programming in Haskell was just a cute parlor trick on how to show existentials and was not very useful until two months ago, and I actually needed it. I doing some consensus uh, research, and I need to run something the same consensus system in a test framework, and the same thing on network computers. So you have a whole bunch of them from all over the world. And I don't want the code to have to change. So that's exactly object-oriented programming. You just plug in a specific instance, and it knows how to do all the right things, but the rest of the code is unaware of that change. So I actually used object-oriented programming. Uh, so given that I used it, I decided, well, it's worth knowing about. So uh, here we go again. We type with the downstream uh, uh, per, per state of OOP. It just takes a 
same thing, the decreasing values, a PS, uh, okay, and a pure state. Notice before, up here, this one took a pure state, a very specific one. Down here now, we're saying, no, no, it's a very specific kind. Uh, and we use that right here. And that is the pure state. We have the same for all that we did before. And we have that state object, which is what we had before. But now we have this function. Uh, so V means value, F means function. And it said that the type of this is one that takes a refined type a PS, which we don't know what it is, and returns that. And same thing for this particular definition, it doesn't know anything about that. To actually make it work, I have this ADS, apply downstream. It's given this function, which takes a pure state, OOP. Notice there's no information about what's it actually, the data it's working on. Uh, and it applies it. So it takes the F out of there, takes the pure state out of there, and it takes the RS from the outside and it applies that function. Okay, so here are the two different objects. I'm creating two different objects. So here's one. I'm creating the pure state. I'm starting with a zero, so I'm using a double. This can be anything, and the last example that I have will actually show you that it can be, you know, a whole record type or deep, you know, as complicated the thing as you need it to be. But here, in this case, it's just a uh, double. And f, where f is a function which takes the readings, the check readings, it takes the doubles, and it does what we've always done. It unrefines them, takes the head, checks it for the end. And as we did before up above, we, ta we also send back the difference between the previous uh, max and now we create a new state with that new ma uh, the new max in, in place of the old one and the same function. Uh, here's DS2, which is exactly the same, except we're ignoring <coughs> the previous state. And right here, instead of returning the difference, we're returning the sum of all of the values seen so far. Uh, it's made up, but the main point is, is we're going to be able to plug these things in with different behavior. And yet the people that call this code, which is right here at line 657, that doesn't change at all. That's the downstream call. Everything else is what we saw a moment ago. So we get back the D, which tells us if we're done. We get back the X, which was going to be different depending on what object we put in and the updated state. So let's take a look and see it run. Let's see it when we run it with DS1. Notice here before we run, look at line 1287 over there on the right. It's returning 10 and 0 0.33 something. So now when I run this one, oh good, it's the exact same thing because we are returning the difference. Now, if I look at the one where I plug in DS2, Notice now the second value here is actually 110 because it's returning the sum. So there you go. Object-oriented programming in Haskell using existentials. And you, a good paper to read on this is Edsko DeVries uh, of Well Typed. It's, it's a really good article on doing a lot more with it, like subclassing, extending all this stuff. And it also has a lot more uh, references in the conclusion section. So I really highly recommend that one. Okay, we're into the home stretch here, type align sequences. So we've been doing the gauge so far and we've been calling downstream and the downstream has been mission control. Now we're gonna actually make a real mission control. It's gonna launch rockets because that's what we wanna do, but we only wanna launch rockets using safe code. So what I have here and, uh, okay, I have a rocket state. 
and the state can be, it can be in the hangar, moving to the launch pad, on the launch pad, being fueled, full of fuel, no problems, launched. How do we get there? Well, we get there with this thing called a path, which is a type aligned sequence. And this is something can be used for where the types in for, for the order. So if you try to do something out of order, the compiler is going to complain. So I have begin, and that's a constructor of a path. Doesn't take any arguments, and it just returns a, the type. And this is using some type level programming. The type is a path of in hanger to moving to launch pad. That's when you begin. And when it's at the pad, it's a path from move. It was moving to the launch pad. Now it's on the launch pad for fueling. It was on the launch pad, now it's being fueled. Fueling more, well, it needs some more fuel. It was in the being fueled state and it's staying in the being fueled state. Fueled, it's being fueled, but now it's full, full. Uh, okay to launch, you have full fuel and no problems and launch. So launch is no problems. Where is the existential? It's right here. Got this operator triple colon, which takes any two paths and creates a path. But notice what it creates only has an A and a C in it. And the A comes from the first component, the C comes from the second component, and this B comes from there, but you don't see it in the output. B is existential. And this is the uh, pattern that uh, in the Jonathan Fiskoff article, we talked about uh, hiding intermediate variables. He called that a pattern. And that is exactly what's going on here. There's this intermediate variable, which a user of this thing doesn't need to know about. It just needs to, and, you'll, and where that is used, and I meant to use it in more places, but I ran out of time, is when I begin, I say it begins, and then it's at the pad. In other words, if you remember, uh, begin itself goes from begin to moving to the launch pad to moving and then at pad goes moving to on launch pad. So by combining these two, the type of this thing is going to be in hangar and on launch pad. Uh, all of that so you could avoid saying that intermediate state. And if you had a whole series of these together, because you can compose these, uh, it would be useful. And he, uh, Jonathan's article does a, a TCP P, uh, sync state, uh, a, a TCP state diagram using, using the same idea. Okay, so the rest of this is just boilerplate. It's another, it's, it's using object-oriented programming, even though I only create one kind of object. Uh, so all of this stuff is the same. I got a existential. The important part here is the type of line sequence. When I say begin, not only does it return an updated mission control, it returns a type, which is path, which is now it's on the launch pad. And to be able to call start fueling, I need to have one of these things in my head of this type, which I got from begin. And when I'm done start fueling, uh, I'm beginning fuel. So I trans transferred a uh, transition to that state. Add fuel. So each one of these outputs becomes the input to the next stage. And that forces the, the, the you to call things in a certain order because the compiler is going to make sure that uh, you have the right type in hand. And the only tricky part here is when I add more fuel, well, I might actually need to keep adding fuel until I'm full, and so I go into kind of a loop. And this is a little hokey, but it's good for a uh, example. Okay, let's skip all the rest of the stuff uh, and go to actually using it. Mission control use. So let's go down here. So I'm gonna make a mission control and then I'm going to call begin. And it says not exhaustive because I'm explicitly grabbing the right, knowing that's gonna work. So it's definitely wrong, uh, but it worked. 
So P2. P2 is a path from in hangar on launch pad, which is exactly what uh, begin returns. And there's no show for that thing. And uh, but fortunately, the the uh, REPL can tell us anyway. So then we do start fueling, and we look at uh, P3, and we see it's now being fueled. We add fuel but only five. And if we look at P4, we see it's in being fueled to the being fueled state. In other words, it needs more fuel. So that allows us to call add more fuel right here. And if we look at the output of that, uh, P5, excuse me, we see it's now fuel full. Uh, hopefully you can read that, it's wrapping around. And then OK to launch. It says no problems. Great, fool, fool, no problems. And finally, let's launch this thing. And look at P6. And it said that, uh, no, P7. Great, it's from no problems to launch. So it says launch. And now let's actually report an error because that was one of the routines. And we're going to report an error, which uh, too late because <laughs> we already launched it. And the last little thing here is uh, this shows it actually in running. And this is a real hack. If you ever see in code a case expression with a left and a right nested to another case expression with a left and a right and another case expression with a left and right, something's wrong. But uh, to get this done by today at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, I needed to do that. So let's actually ro run this rocket. Great, uh, rocket launched. All of that stuff just worked and we couldn't do things out of order. And if I try to do something wrong, it's gonna tell me it's already fueled. And finally, anytime I want a problem, and then if I try to, uh, do a countdown, not that one, this one. It says, oh, the gauges are broke, so I can't proceed. So uh, yeah, uh, where am I? Okay, so the last piece, uh, actually pulled this out, I can't believe it, is back to saying about this, but uh, the existential patterns, things to use to hide an intermediate value. We uh, did that with the type of line sequences hidden types, which we can be unhidden. We use that both in the simple pure state example and in the object oriented one, and also in type aligned data structures. And if you wanna see some a really interesting package, take a look at data TA sequence, because it uses uh, types to enforce element order as a data structure. Uh, I, I was using it here to, re, uh, to enforce call order in a bunch of functions, but you could actually uh, use it here for element order in a sequence. And uh, 302, that's it. Oh, great, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Where's the kaboom? I was expecting an earth shattering kaboom. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean the rocket blew up? <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, so thank you very much um, for that wonderful talk on phantom types and existential types in production. Lots of really great real world, I think, examples. Um, and certainly a lot of references for homework for anybody who caught like at least five of those, maybe somewhere around 10, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. do, you do you have a, a biographies list like that we need to go read? Um, uh, yes, well, actually, if you go here, because this talk is available right here. Uh, all, the, all the code and the code uh, in, is, includes, well, you saw it, it has all those references built into the code. So oh. just go uh, to that GitHub and it has the, what you saw here right there.
Great. Well, we'll be sure to post that with a video on YouTube. Um, so we did have a couple of questions among the congratulations and people telling you that that was a wonderful talk and they appreciated it. Also, somebody thinks that it should be a three hour classroom exercise. <laughs> Um, oh, maybe next year. I promised myself never to do a run a classroom. <laughs> oh, well. But, you know, never say never. Like, never say never. So, um, a couple of questions. The um, triple colon operator sounds like an arrow composition. Um, and somebody was wondering if they could use an arrow instance. I'm not sure what you mean by an error instance, but uh, Air, arrow. Sorry, arrow, like a bow and arrow. Oh, arrow instance. Okay, okay. So, yeah, that's a good question here. There, uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't think so, because in, with the arrows are working with data, and this is working with types. So I've given one of these types or one of these, one of these above here and then another one and we get a new type out of it. Uh, it it's, I don't know enough about arrows to answer that question, but I kind of think the question is no, but I, that's not a definitive answer because I really don't know arrows well enough to answer that. Fair enough. Um, also, can you generalize type aligned sequences, sequences to allow for arbitrary state machine graphs? I think you can. I just learned about type aligned sequences myself. And the first one, and I'd heard about them uh, being used for data structures and Jonathan Fiskos article showing it for TCP states. Uh, had this exact same thing, including the, the triple colon. And so I used it here. And I'm pretty sure you could do that. I'm not, what I'm not sure, if, if it was a simple state machine, it would probably work out okay. If it was a really com complicated one, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the ergonomics of that would be. And the final thing is, is writing you, this, you can't derive a show instance or an EQ instance for these things. And uh, if you actually need to look inside them, uh, it, I had to print these out for whatever debugging, whatever. Well, you can do it in the REPL and the REPL kind of prints it out anyway, but, uh, but it makes it a little hard to use. So I, I, I think you could do that, but I think the ergonomics if the state was a large state machine would be uh, a little daunting. All right. Um, so I think that's our last question for today. Thank you so much, Harold.